So good evening, everybody. We are here tonight to present an editorial project we are extremely proud of. Um, the independent publisher Asterisco Edizioni, which I represent here tonight as member of the editorial group, is about to release the Italian translation of Gaga Feminism, Sex, Gender and the End of Normal, a book by Jack Halberstam published in the US in 2013. Using Lady Gaga as a symbol for a new era, uh, Gaga Feminism deftly unpacks what the pop superstar symbolizes, to whom and why. The result is a provocative manifesto of creative chaos, a roadmap to sex and gender for the 21st century that holds Lady Gaga as, a, as an exemplar of a new kind of feminism that privileges gender and sexual fluidity. Part handbook, part guidebook, and part sex manual, Gaga Feminism is the first book to take seriously the collapse of heterosexuality and find signposts in the wreckage to a new and different way of doing sex and gender. I am glad to have here tonight to present the Italian translation of this book, both the author and the Italian translator. Um, Jack Halberstam does not need much introduction, actually. Um, is a dissident against the barriers of gender norms and professor of American studies and ethnicity. I'm, I'm at Columbia University. I'm a professor of English and comparative literature and um, gender studies. Author of numerous articles in journals and collection. Um, some of his writings have been published in Italian as well, selected and edited by Federica Fabretti and collected in the volume Maschilita Senza Uomini, uh, Edizioni ETS in 2010. Elisa Virgili is a researcher in the field of political philosophy, gender studies and queer theories, and is part of the Politas Research Center of the University of Verona. One of our main areas of research is the relationship between language and gender, between words, public space and bodies. In parallel, she deals with gendered and bleeding bodies in sport. She is part of a weird family that is a pack, a grassroots gym, and a transfeminist collective. After this brief introduction, I will leave the floor to Elisa, who will conduct this conversation. And many thanks, many, many thanks again, uh, both of you for being here with us tonight. Um, thank you, Marta, for this uh, introduction. And um, I would like to thank, first of all, Asterisco Edizioni for wanting to translate and publish this book. I think that in Italy, at this moment in particular, this publication is really important, both from a theoretical perspective and political perspective. And I would like to thank Jack Alberstam, of course, for giving us this opportunity to discuss together some of the most important aspects of the books or at least the most important aspects for us. Um, translating the book has not been easy, but I guess all the translators say this. Of course, we have tried to be as close as possible to the text, but at the same time, we are aware that the translation and the presentation of the book that we will make will create new discourses and will transform a bit, just a bit, don't worry about it, uh, the original concepts. But we also believe that this is what makes a book alive and what makes a book a, a political tool, maybe, in different times and places. So um, thank you <laughs> again. And I don't know, Jack, if you want to say something before I start with the questions or... Uh, yeah, I, well, first of all, um, I really want to thank you uh, for undertaking the work of translation. Translation is, of course, itself a, an act of creation. And um, I know that even as you're translating, you're also thinking about the book in a very different context, as you just said, and preparing it to enter into a different set of conversations than the ones that it originally addressed. Um, and so I really, I really appreciate this. And I also appreciate the opportunity to, to be in conversation with you. Thank you. Um, so, I'm going to start with the first question. Um, I think we can fairly call this book uh, a book about feminism, as well as being a manifesto and an analysis of contemporary society, 
we can see in it several feminist genealogies and some critiques also. Uh, so the question is, what is and what was your relationship with feminism or with feminism, with different feminisms? Yeah, it, it's, it's interesting because, of course, I wrote that book really in 2012, which, uh, and, and then it was published in 2013 uh, or 14, somewhere around there in the U.S. And uh, it was such a That seems like a long time ago now. It really does. Uh, you know, in, in nearly a decade, things have shifted radically in relationship to sex, gender, feminism, activism, um, the world. I mean, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. We've seen a massive shift towards right wing populist leadership, often in the form of charismatic men who deploy their power through the well-worn channels of uh, patriarchy and white supremacy. And so in many ways, um, the world that I described in 2012 was a very different world. And in other ways, we're living in a worse version of it. Uh, on another note, however, the conversations that I thought that I was just sort of on the edges of then about um, Uh, the gender binary have shifted radically too. And so we also live in an era in which the category of non-binary has come to mean an enormous amount to younger people. Um, and the, the edifice of the gender binary itself uh, is, is constructed around some natural idea about male and female bodies, and then the cultural expressions of masculinity and femininity Those are very much things of the past. So it's kind of a, a case of like several steps forward, several steps back. And, and yet, I think that the question of how feminism addresses concerns and political issues for a younger generation remains very urgent. What do I mean by feminism? What I mean by feminism is a... Um, a uh, consolidation of uh, concerns, critiques, uh, and activist practices designed to smash patriarchy, to bring down um, an order of things predicated upon um, uh, male domination and white supremacy. And I also understand feminism as you know, not simply a discourse about women, but as very broadly conceived, a one of the premier places for conversations about the politics of gender as they, um, as they are in solidarity with other conversations around class, race, and sexuality. Thank you. And um, the second question is... Uh, The book analyzed different cultural products and used uh, Lady Gaga as a shining tool of feminism or for feminism. And I intentionally used the word tool because it seems to me that Lady Gaga is much more than example or a case study to analyze. So uh, now, almost 10 years later, what kind of pop cultural example will you give us? in the place of Lady Gaga, if you want to replace Lady Gaga, I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's funny, when, when I was taking this book around to publishers, uh, you know, 10 years ago, uh, there were two responses to the, the book. I mean, people were kind of interested, and then there was a, the response was, this will go a lot better um, trying to place this book if you take the term feminism out of the title. That was one response. Yeah. The other response was, this will go a lot better in terms of publishing the book if you take the term Gaga out of the title. You know, and it was like people wanted one or the other, no feminism or no Gaga. And one person explained the Gaga thing to me as, you know, Lady Gaga will come and go, she'll rise and fall, and you want your feminism Uh, the version of feminism that you put forward here to remain standing separate from her iconic status in world popular culture. And that's absolutely right. And I tried deliberately 
not to write the book as if Lady Gaga was a kind of example of something, so much as to say in that moment, 2012, she embodied, embodied a kind of popularization of a particular understanding of the flexibility of gender and the potential for a widespread feminist politics that had almost nothing to do with who she actually was or what she personally believed and had everything to do with what I understood to be a kind of gaga sensibility that she was able at certain moments to harness and unleash. And to be fair, Lady Gaga, I mean, a couple of things. She has had staying power. She's still around. She's now an actress. She's about to come out in a film called The House of Gucci. She made uh, a, a, another film, um, A Star is Born. You know, she's, she didn't go anywhere. Yeah, actually, she just uh, appeared ye yesterday evening in an uh, Italian talk show, TV talk show. Oh, right. Uh, talk yeah, talking about... Uh, um, LGBTQ movements and about um, the situation in Italy and actually people still uh, seeing uh, born this way in the squares so yeah. yeah and you know I distance myself in the book from born this way because I don't believe in a kind of biological um, explanation of sexuality um, and therefore a plea for recognition on the basis of we were born this way, we can't help it. I, I'm making the argument that, in fact, this is a, an absolutely culturally and politically and socially constructed movement uh, by people who came to their queerness through many different uh, routes and have taken up residence in queerness with the goal of transforming society, not disappearing into it. And the born this way trajectory is one of like saying, we're natural too, we, we homosexuals, we're also uh, natural, therefore just admit us into your homes, into your families and everything will be cool. That's not the kind of project that I join uh, my uh, um, project to. I'm much more in line with... Um, the kind of work being done under the banner of Feminist International. And this is a very important book by Argentinian feminist, it, interesting name, Veronica Gago. If I was to write my book today, maybe it would have been, to answer your question earlier, a Gago feminism, in that I think this is one of the most important books in feminist theory to come out in the last three decades, um, precisely because in the Feminist International, Veronica Gago, uh, an Argentinian activist, makes a call, as she says in the subtitle, to change everything, to change everything. And she proposes that feminism is the unit most capable of transforming everything. And why is that? Because she says if we call a general strike, and it's just a general strike of people who work, we miss all of the unpaid domestic labor that women do in the, work, in the home and in relationship to babies and children. Um, and domestic labor and immaterial labor. And at the same time, if we, if we think that the strike is just about people who work, we favor a kind of heroic understanding of activism built around the, the for the most part, the white male working class subject. Instead, Gago calls for a general strike that is, in her words, transversal and unites sex workers, trans women, uh, women with children, queers, uh, and renegade feminists in a project to change everything. And that's more the kind of project that I had in mind. And even though I approach this from a pop cultural aspect in many ways, um, I think that I'm very much in line with the kinds of arguments that Gago is making. I hope the next question doesn't seem too much relating to my job as a translator, but... <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's not about that. It's about uh, more about uh, the queer concept, let's say. Um, in the book, you talk about how concepts, and in particular, the definition of different gender identities, are closely linked to the place where they develop. For this reason, we decide not to translate the term uh, queer, queerness, or butch, for example, even if there are some terms in Italian we could use 
but uh, for many reasons, these translation attempts have not become we spread uh, during the, la the last, let's say, last three or two decades. Um, on the other hand, precisely because it's not been translated, the term queer has developed its own history and meanings in Italian context. What do you think about it, oh, about this choice? The choice not to translate the term yeah. queer. Um, that makes sense to me, actually. That makes total sense. Because when you translate queer, paradoxically, it seems as if queer is a universal term and just needs to be translated in the, into each local context. When, in fact, as you just said, the way in which queer has a crude meaning or being uh, a rallying point for a particular kind of political orientation is really different in Italy, um, given the configuration of family, church, government that organizes social and political life there than it might be in the US. And for those reasons, I think not translating queer reminds people that queer has a Euro-American uh, origin um, and it, 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 for, it forestalls universal application. Now, the category of butch is a different, different thing altogether because it turns out like when uh, female masculinity, one of my other books was translated into Spanish, for example, there I wrote a new introduction for the book and I pointed to the fact that in Spanish, there are many, many terms used to signify butchness. Uh, tortiera, um, bombera, there are, there, are, there are terms that refer to somebody's work, like the fireman. There are terms uh, that are crude um, kind of insults that have been turned into identity categories. Um, but the fact that there were so many terms in Spanish indicated that there was a flourishing and very visible community of butch people in Spanish-speaking contexts. Um, my guess is that in Italian, there are probably some terms for masculine women that you know you could use to translate yeah. butch. Yeah, we have like a uh, camionara. Is camionara, yeah, same in Spanish, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's which means related. a truck driver, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's related to job. So, but um, I don't know. This choice is. Uh, we, we made this choice for the reason that you already said just now, but also because we tried to make uh, a, the translation quite of a um, collective thing. Yeah. So we would like to respect the, the path of yeah. these terms in the social movement and in the social context. So even if there are some uh, terms, uh, these terms are not so use uh, so much uh, as uh, butch or queer so at the end the movement choose queer so. okay okay i mean um I, I think that that's i think these choices are really reasonable i mean i was writing about a anglo-american context i made some comments in the book about the way in which female masculinity in particular has a kind of ubiquity and there are always going to be women, people who are assigned female at birth, who later on come out as masculine and who are a kind of disruptive presence in any given culture, but who are situated in those cultures in very different ways. And I do have a section of the book where I address that. But at the end of the day, this is about gender norms and variations in an Anglo-American context. So I, I totally get that. Yeah, uh, speaking of um, political movements or social movements, um, among political, social and cultural movements, who do you think has answered the call made by this manifesto, by your book? Well, I don't, you know, this book was not uh, the success that I, I had hoped for. It's, it's an interesting thing because... That at the same time that my book came out, there were like five other books came out that year on feminism and they were often reviewed together, but without mine. And I get it. My book was a bit more academic. Um, it was a little bit more wacky. You know, it wasn't coming from a journalistic uh, perspective. 
it may, maybe it seemed less serious or something. But books like um, Hannah Rosen's The End of Man, and then of course the big one was Roxane Gay's uh, Bad Feminism came out a little bit later. And that was the one that really captured people's imagination. And that's what happens in publishing currently. Publishing, it, it sort of follows along the lines of social media in the sense of there are viral publishing events and then there are there are things that are published that have have their own sort of moderate impact and i would say that my book was not taken up necessarily in the ways that i imagined but it was used and is used as a kind of undergraduate teaching tool and that's very um welcome to me that for people who are coming into a kind of gender studies classroom that they might be asked to read this book and try out some of its uh, more outlandish ideas. I think that's a, a good use of it to just spark something in someone who is not yet committed to any particular feminist uh, uh, line of inquiry, but is looking for inspiration. And there are a few things in the book that I think I did quite well, one of which, you know, and I'm, maybe we're going to get into this, but one was the critique of gay marriage, which mm -hmm. I think I, I completely stand by. And I think I can now say 10 years later that um, uh, people like me who did critique gay marriage were right in saying that this would not be a revolutionary project. It would be an assimilative one that has proved to be absolutely accurate. It would not change the lives of poor people or uh, multiply marginalized people but that it would help middle-class people integrate more fully into a kind of financial normativity. And that's exactly what happened. The other thing that my book commented on that has come to be almost like taken for granted now is that the spectacle of the pregnant man, i.e. the trans man who goes off hormones long enough to get pregnant and then has a baby from the position of trans manhood, uh, that's kind of become a thing to the point that places, uh, uh, magazines have been in touch with me recently about the term pregnant people. Like people are, you know, there's a call not to say pregnant women anymore, but to say pregnant people, yeah. because to say pregnant women is prejudicial to the trans man who might be pregnant. I mean, I wouldn't be splitting hairs uh, uh, to that point, but at the same time, I totally understand why a pregnant man would not, you know, a pregnant trans man would not want to be treated throughout the process as a, a woman. And I can imagine that this is also a target of all kinds of turf, um, you know, trans exclusionary radical feminist um, ire and critique. Uh, that's actually something that that, that that book did not see coming was this massive fight between trans women and TERFs that has taken up so much airtime, particularly in the UK. I think that my book just kind of stayed away from that and didn't see that coming at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I totally agree with your critique uh, at uh, um, gay marriage movements. And can you tell us more about the reaction uh, from the gay marriage movement uh, at your critique? Oh, I don't think that, uh, <laughs> you know, there was a ton of reaction. Uh, I'm, because here's the thing, once you've won a battle, you're not going to go back and fight these little skirmishes. They, they won what they wanted to win, which is that mainstream lesbian and gay organizing backed by massive amounts of money, most from white gay men, lesbians who were wealthy um, took that fight all the way through the political system and won it which means that they changed nothing but, mm. uh, were allowed to admit a club be, in, be given admission to a club that had been formed largely around the exclusions of interracial marriage in, up to the 1950s and gay marriage up to the present. And the kind of critique that I offer and that other people like uh, law professor Catherine Frankie have offered, they are, I think that they are important counter narratives, but I think that the people who fought that battle don't care. Yeah, and, and it seems to me that sometimes 
uh, it seems more um, degree thing or a, a, a quantitative quantitative thing so we gain this yeah. and then we we can talk about other things but it's more a qualitative critique because it's not a, right. a matter of um getting one step and then another because if you get the first step i think uh you you've gone in a different direction you've gone in a different direction that's exactly right and as so many people have said i mean you know going back to emma goldman um the critique of marriage has been that marriage has been established to make sure that men would control their wives' money and their wives' bodies. And that feminist critique of marriage stands. It absolutely stands. And then, you know, there are many other um, institutional structures that follow from marriage, including health benefits, the allocation of resources, right? And Uh, this is part of what Judith Butler calls a heterosexual matrix, a much larger set of organizing rubrics of which marriage is one that seem like natural um, outpourings of people's uh, unmediated affection for one another. But there are actually are stagings of uh, certain forms of economy, certain preferences for social arrangements, Um, and a political support system for the status quo. That's what is bundled into marriage. And many, many people, um, you know, in many countries who have, who have supported gay marriage don't think about it that way. So as you say, it's important to have the qualitative critique because there will be no backing down on gay marriage at this point. And there are many people who feel that Uh, gay marriage has been a, a kind of crucial place um, for them to, say, uh, procure a visa uh, in relationship to a partnership that was otherwise transnational or secure health benefits in relationship to a partnership where one partner worked and the other one didn't. But the people who have critiqued gay marriage have said all along, those things should never have been dependent on marriage in the first place. So no one is arguing that you shouldn't access your partner's health benefits or be given uh, a visa uh, to, for admission to a country on the basis of your romantic relationship. Everyone's just saying, how did this become articulated through marriage? And I also think that uh, you, with this critique, um, in a certain way, track a genealogy with uh, feminism. Yeah. Uh, because sometimes it's not so evident that uh, LGBTQ um, issue um, have, are related with feminism. It seems that gay marriage is one thing and the, the feminist issues are other things. But I think with, the, with this critique, you really show yes. uh, that they have the same uh, metrics at, at the thing. Right. And that this was a place where, you know, making a break from feminism, as some LGBT people did in the 70s and 80s around the pornography debates, for example, making a break with feminism can also be a problem because, you know, as Kathy Cohen showed in um, a very important essay, uh, Punks, Bull Daggers and Welfare Queens, you know, things that are great for gay and lesbians may or may not be Uh, um, good for poor women living with children. And so if you have a bigger social project in mind in which queer people and uh, women and trans women and uh, sweatshop workers are in some way to share political trajectories, you need feminism. And that's why the book is Gaga Feminism. It's not just a book about queer issues. And I do try hard to show the places where a radical theory of feminism has benefits for LGBT people and where a radical theory of queerness has benefits um, in relationship to a feminist project. Yeah, thank you. And I have um, a last question. Um, for several years in Italy, we have been trying to get a law against homophobia. And just a few weeks ago, it was this law was rejected for good in Parliament. Um, so what role can cultural change play, in particular a change as radical as the one you propose in Gaga Feminism in a country 
uh, that does not even approve law like this. Okay, thank you for that question, um, Eliza. Um, look, the law is always late. You know, students who come and sit in my office and say they want to go to law school, you say, why? They say, I want to change the world. Uh, and then you have to say, you don't change the world through the law. You don't. The law changes precisely because the culture has changed, right? It took years and years of civil rights activism um, for, uh, you know, black people in the U.S., to register the inherent racism that was built into the political system. And the, all the concessions that were made in the civil rights era have been sort of pulled back one at a time. So the law is not the place where change happens. The place where change happens is culturally and socially. And once those changes that are happening culturally and socially are persuasive to large numbers of people, then the law comes in later on and passes something that registers those changes as they have occurred elsewhere. But you don't bring change through the law. You ratify change in the law. So my guess would be that in, in a place like Italy, where you have some combination of like patriarchal households, the, the church, you know, um, and the, the uh, certain kinds of conventional understandings of gender very firmly in place, there needs to be a cultural revolution. And after the cultural revolution, then there's a, there are opportunities to mark those changes in relationship to the law. But for the most part, the law is something that we should be fighting because the law tends to prop up the status quo. The law tends to support governmental um, actions and decisions, even when they're in violation of international standards. Um, the law is made by white men, you know, for the most part, white powerful men or wealthy men. Um, the law is not made uh, on behalf of radical change. So, yes, if that's the opposition, I will take a kind of cultural uh, route to transformation every time. And that is what I advocate for in Gaga Feminism. And it isn't the only route. And I do recommend that people look at Veronica Gago's very important book, The Feminist International, for a much more political, um, a, a sort of political theory oriented argument for how to change everything. But my little project under the heading of Gaga Feminism is a kind of, you know, wild, anarchistic, attempt to get people excited uh, on behalf of the same project, change everything. Thank you. So it, it seems there will be also, it seems a suggestion for Asterisco Edizioni to translate uh, <laughs> this book. Yes, de so. definitely, definitely. Yeah. And uh, I really hope that the, the, the translation of this book could help this cultural revolution, I mean, could be a little piece of uh, of uh, of this of this cultural revolution. So um, I don't want if you want would like to add something else. Um, if you want, there is something that you want to say about. Just to say, uh, I hope there's another time we can meet in person, all of us. Uh, you know, it's very hard to be um, doing. Uh, the things that we do right now that have a kind of political orientation to do them in these very mediated ways on these mediated platforms, uh, it separates us and it changes the way in which we talk to each other. So hoping that there are times to come when we meet in person uh, and, uh, you know, get active together in an embodied uh, context. Yeah. I hope so. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, this this uh, mediating uh, discourses has really had really affect uh, also political movements. And uh, yeah, you can you, now you can see starting again people in the streets and in the squares yeah. uh, protesting against something or reclaim something, but it's really difficult after two years uh, staying again 
with other bodies in the same place. <laughs> so yes. yes, and good luck to everybody in Italy. And um, uh, you know, I hope that we can not just get through COVID, but get through the kind of austerity measures that governments have taken the opportunity to impose. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you again for this interesting conversation. Um, yeah, if I could, I could stay here to ask you all the things about the translation, mm -hmm. but <laughs> it could be boring for you. So just hoping that the translation will be okay. And at least uh, uh, we also read The Queer Art of Failure. So we take also the failures about this book. It will be, <laughs> it will be nice. <laughs> Thank um, you so much. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate it.